Hello, and welcome to the latest edition of Wood Chat, a series of podcasts produced by Forest and Wood Products Australia. I'm Victoria. And I'm Sam. And today we're back in Melbourne to meet with a distinguished international academic and leading industry figure. We'll be discussing, amongst other things, his appointment to the role of director within Australia's National Centre for Timber Durability and Design Life. But before we do, let's get some background on the centre from the people behind this important strategic initiative, Forest and Wood Products Australia themselves. Here's Managing Director Rick Sinclair. The new National Centre has been set up to address a couple of key problems that were identified in the forest sector. One is the issue that we've had a loss of key research capacity within the sector since the closure of the CSIRO divisions and some of the state agencies. This expertise provided some of the core uh, understanding and information around timber design life and durability. Within the industry, we've been talking about issues around timber life prediction and durability, but we kept coming back to the fact there was no common evidence base to actually deal with. So we actually set up this centre in conjunction with uh, the University of Sunshine Coast, the Department of uh, Agriculture and Fisheries in Queensland uh, and uh, UQ because we wanted to actually put a new capacity in the sector that will help deal with the problems not only now but in the longer term. One of the key outcomes that we're hoping that this centre will achieve is a systems-based approach to timber life predictability, uh, which designers, uh, specifiers can use to actually make sure that they're using the right wood in the right application with the right maintenance. This information has existed in a range of formats, design uh, guides or other tools, but what we hope is that we can actually make this far more uh, interactive and building on some of the new climate change science as well as some of the other new threats that are likely to come into the Australian environment. Interesting stuff. So, as we mentioned before, it's an exciting time for the Centre with the appointment of Professor Jeff Morell as Director, currently Professor in the Department of Wood Science and Engineering at Oregon State University. Professor Morell brings with him invaluable experience and expertise. His past research has focused on wood preservation, uh, on which he's published over 300 peer review papers. He's also former president of both the American Wood Protection Association and the International Research Group on Wood Protection. He also currently holds the position of chair at the Committee on Treatment Standards for Utility Poles. This role has seen him work with a variety of treaters on quality control, particularly with difficult-to-treat species. Jeff's appointment will see him focus on rebuilding linkages between the research community, timber suppliers and the end user. It's a process he's already begun by hosting a number of consultation sessions across the country with industry representatives to get their thoughts on the centre's direction. Today, Jeff's in Melbourne doing exactly that and has kindly allowed some time in his diary to sit down with us for a chat. Hi, Jeff, and welcome to Melbourne. Congratulations on your appointment to the centre and to your move down under. Well, thanks. I appreciate coming here. So you're from the USA and you've spent the majority of your career based there. Can you tell us a bit about what it was that attracted you to this role and convinced you to make such a big move? It it is a big move because I've been at Oregon State where I've been for 35 years, but we've done work here for the past decade and I, I did part of a sabbatical here in 2006, 2007. So we like Australia. We've been coming back every other year. And it's a nice place to be, and I'm looking forward to it. The center is an attractive opportunity to do something bigger than I've been doing, and different, and that's what's attractive. It's obvious that you're passionate about the industry and have been involved in some really important wood-based research. How did you get into the field initially? I always wanted to be a forester. And even though I grew up outside New York City, which is not a heavily forested area, I I really liked it, and I got to college, and I took a course with a fellow who engaged me in durability, which I never thought about as a career, but he was so good, and I really got into it, and and that was the starting point. And from there, I moved through lots of different areas, learning more and more about wood, which was not originally a passion for me, but but it's important. Um, If you look at timber, timber is an incredible resource. We have forest, massive forest, we use the wood in everywhere, Australia does, America does, but we waste a lot of it. And I think part of my drive for being a forester is sort of met by looking at trying to reduce the losses we have in timber by helping people use wood better. 
As Victoria just mentioned, you've been involved with some fascinating research globally. With such a long and distinguished career, it will probably be impossible for us to cover off everything, but could you talk us through just a few of your highlights? A lot of what we've done for improving treatment has been more on terms of large timbers and improving treatment, and, and not just on the treatment side, but also on the engineering side to make sure that things that are done are not going to be detrimental to the materials. So, for example, there's a process called through boring for utility poles that was developed in the 1960s, but there were, there were very few data showing that it worked or showing that it didn't have engineering effects. And we did all the testing. So we broke 400 utility poles to test out the properties and move it through the standards so that it could be incorporated in the national standards. Those are the kind of things we've, we've done a lot of. I think the bigger part of what, what you do as, an, as a faculty member, though, is educating the next generation. And that's probably the most important thing I've done is watching my students go through, go out, and succeed. And maybe I'm not the responsible party for that, that's them, but you're part of that and watching that next stage. And actually the, the center is sort of that, because one of the purposes of the center is to sort of reinvigorate Australian research and make sure that there is a next generation that starts doing treatment and durability work again. One of the center's key areas of focus is a commitment to representing the research needs of the industry. What plans do you have around research for the center? So I, I think as far as the center goes, the the first phase of this is going to be more exploratory. I, I have a, I understand the American system. I, I have a vague understanding of the Australian system. And I think the first steps are going to be going out and meeting with industry face to face, visiting their facilities, talking with them about what they do, what they see as their problems so that we can identify a pathway that, that meets the needs of as many people as possible. It will meet the needs of everyone, but that, that's the way life works. And from there, using the students and staff to sort of address those needs, but then also under that, create a longer term research agenda so that at the end of the day, you're not just answering the immediate questions, which are important, but making the choices that five, 10 years out, that information that needs to be there, that's what universities do best. They think ahead because they have the latitude to do that, whereas the industry has to solve the immediate problem. And if we can work together to solve the problems but then think ahead, then we work better together. Wood durability is a long-term game. You don't do things in two or three years. You do them in five, 10, 15 year increments because it just takes that long for things to happen. And I think you have to sort of think out that far and, and take risks. And I have really broad interests. And, and I tend to jump into things, sometimes even when I don't necessarily know I should. But I, I, I see myself, I see this program working across disciplines, particularly with the engineering community. So I think that's a really important part of this, is getting engineers and architects on board to understand wood as a material. And, and part of the research program has to do that as well. And so some of the partners, University of Queensland is a good example of that. They would be a, a really good, strong engineering partner in, in the system. Um, those I want to reach out outside of Queensland too to make sure that I, that I touch other universities. That's going to be a learning, a bit of a learning process. So I think one of the things we want to look at is we talk about chemical treatments, which everybody assumes is durability, but durability is much more than that. Durability is design. Durability is understanding the materials and the species. Durability is about proper installation. Durability is about maintenance. And I think all of those parts are going to be parts of the center in one way or another. Um, Australia is blessed with a, a fairly sizable number of naturally durable eucalyptus species that have really tremendous market potential. And part of the center is going to be looking at how those materials perform as well, not just, not just the treated wood, because there's definitely a desire on some people's part to have naturally durable woods. So do you have any specific strategies in mind around engagement? Money helps. But I, I think also going out and giving guest lectures to engineering uh, faculties and offering up lectures here and there just to get my face out there. I mean, I'm not that widely known here, and so I have to make sure I get out and meet people across the country. That will be part of the, part of the initial phase of the center is to go out and basically talk to other university people and identify students who can come. One of my goals is... I don't think everybody's, every student's going to be Australian, but it makes more sense to recruit Australians to, to build this program because they're more likely to stay. And we've heard that you have some exciting plans around predictive models in particular. There, there are none. There are very few people who've tried to do this on a, 
national scale. Australia is one of the few groups that has. And the fellow who did, who led the work, Bob Lester, is now retired. He won a, a major international award for doing it because it was so innovative at the time. The the model itself is is actually not bad. It just needs it needs updating. It needs more data because of how it was built at the time. And my goal is going to be to try and work with the people who worked on it before, looking at the data, but also trying to fill in the gaps that are there so that the model can be expanded outward. It, it could be incredibly useful to predict, get, help people gain a better sense of, of reliability of wood. I think the alternative materials often tout themselves as being eternal, lasting forever, and, and they don't last forever, Every, everything falls apart. But trying to get people to, to see wood for, for the value and how long it can last, and making sure engineers and architects understand how to use it so it will last, are, are going to be part of that modeling system. Okay, so how would it be used and what advantages could that bring for industry? So uh, how would it be used? It, it, if, if it's, it'll really depend on how functional it is and, and whether, in order to make it, it has to be meaningful to the engineering community, otherwise it's not going to be used at all. And right now I don't think it's used to a great extent and, and that's partly because it's very limited in what it, its scope is. That's going to involve engaging the community to see what what they want to see out of the model. What are they? I mean, do they want to know when a build, how long a building is going to last exactly? Because I don't think anybody can do that. Do they want to know when it's going to have problems? Nobody can do that either. I think that you have to understand the limitations and give the give them some parameters to work with. It's a lot harder than it sounds, and and I think that's why no very few people have tried it. So what's the reasoning? What could some of the advantages be? One of the great advantages of wood is that it's renewable. We can always grow more. And, and it has this green footprint. It's more or less carbon neutral. The, the, the Achilles heel of wood has always been that its durability is questionable. And, and getting people to understand the practicalities and limitations of using wood as a material helps them become more comfortable with using it in comparison to alternative materials. There's a, across the globe, I think, there's, a, there's definitely a movement towards timber. And, and I think architects and engineers, they want to be green. And part of being green is being carbon neutral. And, and, and the alternative materials have tremendous energy inputs. Wood doesn't. And, and so I think the advantage will be that this is another tool that the, the building community can use to, to support the use of timber in some of these mid-rise buildings and some of the mass timber we're seeing. Well, you've met with some key industry figures here in Melbourne today. Were there any particular insights that stood out? What were the main takeaways for you? I think the the discussions today were pretty they were pretty broad ranging, trying to figure out where the center goes, and I, and I think one of the important parts of these meetings is to try and gain buy-in from the from the uh, supporters of the levy, so that they see value in what we're doing and what we're starting to do, but they also understand the that it's going to take some time to get going. There were a number of good ideas brought up today and, and also talking about how to engage and make sure that we work cooperatively with everybody in the system to, to get them to buy into some things that may not be initially attractive to them. So I think today's discussion was, it was more generic because the center hasn't really come out with highly specific actions yet. It will over the next few months. But the point here today is not to have those out there, but to encourage people to come up with different ideas that we may not have thought of. It certainly sounds like exciting times ahead. Are there any specific challenges that you could foresee? Well, I think the staffing will take a little bit of time to get people in. That'll be fine. Uh, we're negotiating for lab space in Brisbane that hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get because it would be quite nice to have the facilities there. I think the biggest challenge for me is just going to be to get out and meet with people and get them to know me so that they feel comfortable talking to me about what they want to see. And if we do that initially, I think the center gets off to a good start. Um, I'm used to working with the industry. I've spent my entire career doing that. I'm comfortable and I, and I know some of the players here. I'm going to learn to meet a lot more and that'll be kind of fun. I enjoy problem solving. So I think this is going to be a fun experience. So you've obviously spent time working both in the USA and here in Australia. Can you tell us about any differences you've noticed when it comes to the way research is viewed and managed in two different countries? Yeah, or even any similarities. 
There, there are actually a surprising number of similarities, and we, we have similar problems across the globe. It isn't just Australia, America, U.S., it's Europe and South and Africa as well. We generally don't use wood well. We generally don't do all the things we should to it, and that's a universal problem. We have many of the same issues with chemicals. We have many of the same issues of treating wood and difficulties of treating wood. There's a lot of overlap, and, and I think that's why the potential for collaborating internationally is part of this, but also the potential to solve some of the problems here that, that have been addressed elsewhere makes it more interesting to do. Can you give us any examples of where those problems have been resolved? Well, then I don't know that they're resolved. I, it, I think what we look at are, you know, wood is an incredibly lovely material, but it's incredibly variable. And there are difficulties in impregnating it with some, with some preservatives. And those problems occur everywhere. And there have been multiple solutions, many of which came out of Australia, that people have looked at. Um, and I don't think there's any one solution. And, and I think when you look at Australia, there are hardwood problems, there are softwood problems. And, and addressing each is going to be slightly different. And the softwood problems are, are probably more related to ensuring that there's uniform quality across the system. The hardwood problems are much more fundamental. It's the wood. It's kind of, and so there's opportunities for research in different paths there. And what about the proportion of women in the industry? Have you noticed any differences there between the two countries? I don't know about Australia yet so far, and I'll, and I'll say that. In the United States, the women are definitely underrepresented in the system, and it's a hard one to overcome. We've We've not attracted them to our programs as, as educational programs, and um, that has to change. Our, the program I'm moving from has actually become almost 50-50 female-male. That's very exceptional. But we definitely have to recruit. I mean, it's half the world is female, and if we don't have that represented, it's not good for the system, and we lose incredible brain power. So I think that's part, going to be part of, of recruiting here. And what about the aging forestry population? How's the USA address 